All right, so let's get started. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the third installment of Global Forest Watch's Frontiers and Forest Monitoring webinar series. My name is Alice Gottesman, and I am Global Forest Watch's User Outreach Specialist. Today, we'll be presenting on Research Horizons for Global Forest Watch. Before we get started, I wanted to give you a quick overview of how you can ask us questions about the webinar. If you have a question about what we're presenting on, please click the Q&A button and type it in there. At the end of our presentation, we'll have time to answer questions that were typed into that section. Otherwise, we are recording this webinar and we'll send out the recording along with the presentation in the next week or so. You can stay on top of the latest in forest monitoring with Global Forest Watch's Frontiers and Forest Monitoring webinar series. Through the series, individuals and organizations can learn more of the fundamentals behind the data on Global Forest Watch to make better use of it for monitoring and protecting forests. In the first installment, we provided foundational information about remote sensing, and in the second installment, we provided a deeper understanding of how we get from a satellite image to the pink pixels displayed on the Global Forest Watch map. Today, we'll be focusing on Global Forest Watch's ongoing research. Let's get started. Our presenters today are Michaela Weiss, a project manager at Global Forest Watch, and David Gibbs, a GIS research associate at Global Forest Watch. Michaela leads Global Forest Watch's strategy and partnerships for satellite-based forest monitoring. She has particular interest in on-the-ground use of early warning deforestation systems and leads Global Forest Watch's engagement with law enforcement. David works on a variety of forest monitoring research projects. His primary, oops, sorry, his primary subject area um, is mapping how forests capture, store, and emit carbon. All right, so the goal of the webinar today is to provide a preview of ongoing research focused on three core, core questions. Can we detect forest change faster and in greater detail? Can we improve our understanding of what causes forest loss? And lastly, can we map how much carbon forests are emitting and sequestering? To give you all a brief overview of Global Forest Watch, Global Forest Watch offers an integrated, openly accessible suite of tools designed to enable experts and non-experts alike to access information about forest change and mobilize action. Some high-level examples of how this is done include Increasing knowledge and transparency about forest landscapes. Global Forest Watch tools and data offer access to the state of the world's forests to everyone everywhere for free. Harnessing information to mobilize local action by governments and civil society. We have a variety of partners and some programs that help promote data-driven action. And lastly, advancing private sector action to stop commodity-driven deforestation and manage forests sustainably. One of our tools, GFW Pro, allow the private sector to measure risk associated with their supply chains. Here's an example of what you can see on the Global Forest Watch platform. This particular data set is the near real-time GLAD deforestation alerts. The GIF visualizes as tree cover loss spreads, indicating a new logging road entering a national park buffer zone in Peru. Moving forward, we'll offer insight into where we are improving uh, near real-time alert data, understanding the drivers or causes of tree cover loss, and monitoring carbon. At the end of the presentation, we'll provide ample time for questions. I'll now pass it off to Michaela to talk about the near real-time alerts. Great. Thank you so much, Alice. Um, so as Alice said, I'm going to start by talking about near real-time alerts and different products and, and projects we have to try and detect forest change faster and in even greater detail than we do now. Um, so Alice mentioned and showed a GIF already of the GLAD deforestation alerts from the University of Maryland. Um, and you know, this is a, a common feature you'll see on Global Forest Watch right now covering the tropics. Um, but there are a few ways that we think we can improve upon these alerts. One of those is to reduce the delays in detection related to cloud cover. Um, you know, since we are relying on, on uh, satellite images, what we call optical satellite images, 
Um, those can be blocked anytime there are clouds, which is fairly often in, uh, in tropical rainforests. Um, and so using new technologies to try and overcome some of those limitations and detect change faster than ever. Uh, a second improvement is that there are now a number of freely available satellite um, image providers that have even higher resolution satellite imagery. And so we, we think we can use those to actually detect changes that are even smaller than we do with the, the GLAD alert. And finally, as we think about all of these different sensors and different alert products, um, we're asking ourselves this question of if it's possible or uh, how we can combine multiple different alert systems and sensors in order to improve our confidence in detections of deforestation. So today I'm going to talk about two alert systems that we have in the works with partners. Um, the first, the GLAD Plus alerts uh, use Sentinel-2 imagery from the Europe European Space Agency. And the second uses Sentinel-1 data, uh, also from the Europe European Space Agency, uh, but that's based on radar information. And then I'll talk a little bit about our thoughts and the questions we have about how to potentially bring So if you tuned in to the second installment of the Frontiers in Forest Monitoring series, uh, you will have heard Professor Matt Hansen talk a bit about these alerts already. Um, so this is a project by the University of Maryland, the same group that produces the GLAD alerts. And right now we're working with them um, on what we're calling GLAD Plus, um, might change the name eventually. But essentially what, what that system does is uh, it's quite similar to the GLAD alerts, except that we're going to be using Sentinel-2 images um, instead of Landsat. Um, and so Sentinel-2 is, is a fairly similar uh, satellite to Landsat, but instead of 30 meter resolution, it's 10 meter pixels on the ground. Um, and so it is a bit higher spatial resolution. And also we have a revisit time of around every five days. So it's a, a bit more, a bit higher resolution and a bit more frequent than uh, with Landsat images. So right now we have a, a prototype that we're building out to cover the Amazon basin um, that I'm, I'm hoping will be available uh, around the end of the year or early next year. Um, these are some slides you have already seen if you've watched the second installment, uh, but just to give you an example of what this is going to look like. Um, so here's a, a forest area in the Congo basin. Um, here's an image from October 2018, and you can see kind of these faint roads coming in. Um, so if we look at what we're detecting currently with the, the GLAD alerts, the ones based on Landsat, um, that's what you're seeing here in the white pixels. If we look at the same area at the same time period with the new Sentinel-2 alerts, you can see that we're picking up a lot more of those contours and there's just a lot more spatial detail. And then if we put them both on the same slide, um, the Sentinel-2 alerts only are in red and the places where they're both picking up change are in white. Um, you can see that the Sentinel-2 alerts pick up far more uh, of the pattern, um, you know, the, the details of some of these roads as well as some of the uh, selective logging canopy removals that are happening on, along the outside. So actually we're able to detect some of this selective logging pattern with these alerts because of the added detail. Great. Um, so then moving to the next system. Um, this is also a collaboration, um, this time with Wageningen University in the Netherlands um, and a, a Dutch company called Satelligence. Um, and so this alert system, also 10 meter resolution. Um, the biggest difference is that this is based on actual uh, radar information, which I'll talk about in just a second. Uh, right now we're working on a prototype it, that covers Indonesia, Malaysia, the Congo Basin, and Peru. Um, and again, we're expecting that uh, sometime before the end of the year or, or early in 2021. So be on the lookout for that during that time period. So what is so great about radar data? Well, basically, you know, when we talk about typical optical satellites, um, Landsat and Sentinel-2, um, really we're limited in the amount of imagery that we can capture in cloudy regions. Because basically anytime that there's a cloud, 
we're not able to actually see the ground and so we can't detect whether or not there has been changes. So here's um, just a figure from, from a paper that was published a, a couple of years ago looking at the number of cloud-free Landsat images over the Congo Basin. And you can see that in parts of the Congo Basin, um, especially in the west here, there are some places that have less than one cloud-free satellite image each year. And so when we're talking about near real-time alerts and trying to detect change as soon as possible, you know, we're really going to see very big delays if we're only getting an image once a year or even less than that. It's really going to limit our ability to detect changes. And even in other parts of the Congo Basin, um, you know, that have a bit more coverage, we're still seeing two, three, four images uh, a year. So again, it's, it's not going to give us the really frequently updated uh, kind of products that we would like to see. The great thing about radar data is that uh, because of the, the wavelength, um, it can actually pierce through cloud cover. Um, and so essentially what that means is that every time that the satellite goes past, we are going to get information about what's happening in the forest below. And it's going to be very consistent regardless of the weather conditions um, and it's also regardless of whether it's collecting imagery during the day or at night. Um, and so this Sentinel-1 sensor from the European Space Agency is really novel because First of all, it's, it's freely available um, data. And second is that it actually has this global acquisition strategy um, where it's, it's basically covering every point on Earth every 12 days. And so you can see the, the strips, um, the way it collects imagery in the Congo Basin. Um, most of the Congo Basin is picked up every 12 days. And then there are some areas, um, especially where there is volcanic activity or where there are overlaps um, of these different tracks where you actually get even more frequent imagery than that. Um, so basically we're guaranteed to get new information every 12 days, regardless of what's going on um, in the weather. Um, and just to visualize that a little bit more, here's an area in Indonesia where we've been working with, with a prototype of these alerts. Here's a Sentinel-2 image, you know, it's very cloudy. Um, we pretty much, you know, you can see a little bit of the river here, but there's really uh, not much that you can see when there is this much cloud cover. In contrast, here's a Sentinel-2 image, or a Sentinel-1 image rather, um, that you can see is not impacted by clouds at all. Um, <clears throat> again, in the first installment, we talk a bit more about these sensors and how they're different and how they work. So I definitely recommend checking that out if you're interested. Um, <clears throat> but I'll just say here that, you know, radar images are a bit different. I find them a bit um, more difficult to interpret, right, because it doesn't work the same way that your, your eyes do, right? It's not like you're taking a picture from space with your, with your phone. Um, instead, it's looking at how radar waves that are emitted from the satellite are then returned and captured. Um, and so I find it a bit harder to interpret, but if, you know, you have expertise and, and uh, have practice looking at these images then actually it becomes a lot clearer. So looking at the pattern and, and the way it's structured, um, just labeled some areas here on the map where, you know, what's showing up in green here and these nice neat rows, these are oil palm plantations. Um, the purple areas are where those oil palm plantations have actually been cut down, again, in, in these kind of nice neat rows. Um, and then these speckled uh, areas, kind of in yellow, green, um, are actually the, the healthy tropical forest. Um, and so basically what um, Bachening and, and is doing for these alerts um, is we're looking at, you know, because we have these images every 12 days, we're looking at how the reflectance changes over time. Um, and so we, you know, we have kind of a, a baseline period where we can get information about how things look different um, over different seasons and we can kind of take that into account. Um, and then basically we can look for these sharp drop-offs or sharp changes um, in what's going on in the ground that can give us a sense of when uh, deforestation has taken place. Um, and so the way that the system works, we're first going to uh, flag an area as a detection. And then once we get a few more observations and are a bit more confident, then that uh, it alert is actually going to become confirmed. 
So the dashed line here would be when I was first kind of flagged and then the dark red line is when uh, we actually feel pretty confident that that alert has been confirmed as a change. Um, I won't go too much into this uh, figure. Uh, as Ella said, we are gonna distribute the slides after the fact, um, but this is from an upcoming paper um, that shows the process of how this works. Um, the important things here is that, you know, we have kind of this historical Sentinel-1 data for the last few years that gives us that baseline. And then we're putting in each new latest Sentinel-1 image and using the two of those in combination, then we can look at the probability that there has been a forest disturbance. Um, and based on that probability, we can either, you know, we can flag an alert. Um, and then again, as we get more confident and, and have more images that give us a higher probability, then we can confirm um, that there actually is an alert there. Okay, so what does this actually look like? So here's the same area um, in Indonesia. Oops. And um, here we are just going week by week and picking up detections here in red. Um, and so you can see, you know, what's I think really notable about this system compared to, uh, you know, the Landsat or Sentinel-2 systems is that really we are getting information each and every week. Um, and so it's very reliable um, and very consistent that we're going to actually get these detections. Um, what you might notice looking at this is that most of the changes are actually happening within those green oil palm plantations. Um, and so we can use other information about where those plantations might be um, to actually separate out, um, you know, where there is just change because plantations are cycling. That's what's shown here in yellow. Um, and then in red are the areas that were a natural forest um, and now have been uh, deforested. So some of those areas in red there along the river um, are actual deforestation. Um, to give some results now for the Congo Basin, I uh, pulled out a couple of examples for you. Uh, the one on the left is a logging road and selective logging. And you can see similar to the, the GLAD plus alerts using Sentinel-2, you know, we can really clearly see the road, um, but we can also see the, the canopy disturbances alongside of it that are indicative of selective logging. Um, and then we have a, a figure here looking at um, shifting cultivation, small-scale agriculture in the Democratic Republic of Congo um, that are, you know, these, these very small patches happening along the edge of the forest. So again, a lot of spatial detail there. Um, this is that same logging road. I just pulled it out as a GIF um, so you could really see the change over time. And again, you know, I think what's special is the the spatial resolution that we're able to get so much detail and, and get these like uh, canopy disturbances from selective logging, but also is just the number of time steps that we're really able to see this road network expand over time and get a better understanding um, of how it has expanded. Um, and then just a brief comparison with the GLAD alerts. Um, so the, on the left, we have the, the same area with the Sentinel-1 Sentinel alerts um, and the GLAD alerts. Um, and you can see that, you know, the, the logging road is picked up much better by the RAD alerts because of the increased resolution, um, as well as, as we talked about, you know, some of that selective logging pattern, <coughs> excuse me, that happened at the end of that road. Um, and then on the right, we have the, the same area looking at um, more like small scale cultivation. Um, and in, in this example, you know, the, the rat alerts and the glad alerts are actually a bit more similar um, in what they detect. Uh, I think with the rat alerts, you know, we can be a bit more precise around the edges um, than, than with the glad alerts that are based on Landsat. Okay, so, you know, we're really excited about both of these new uh, alert systems. I think they're going to bring a lot of uh, detail and, and confidence and detection and, and reduce some of those lag times like we talked about. Um, I think the challenge for us going forward and kind of what we're starting to think about now, this is definitely in the very early stages, is how we actually bring those pieces together 
Um, and, you know, if there's a way that we can not just have three different alert systems that are operating, um, but combine them in some way to actually get uh, a, a better product. So again, this is really early days. Um, I just want to list some of the things that we're thinking about um, and definitely interested if, if folks are interested to engage and think about this further um, to, to follow up after this webinar. So some of the things that we've been asking ourselves is, you know, if we can actually combine these three alert systems that are based on three different streams of satellite information, can we actually confirm alerts earlier or increase our confidence um, because we're using basically totally independent sources um, to detect defrost? We're also thinking a lot and heard from a lot of users that, you know, looking at each individual pixel is too many alerts. And I think especially when we go from uh, Landsat 30 meter resolution to Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 at 10 meter resolution, which is a, um, a nine fold change in resolution, you know, we're just gonna have an overwhelming number of pixels. And so starting to think about if there are ways that we can cluster and think about um, alert events rather than individual pixels. Um, and then I think, you know, having to deal with different coverages, different resolutions, different time frames from all these three systems is going to be a challenge for us to think through um, as well as we move forward. Um, and then finally, if just thinking about if, you know, we do create some kind of a combined product, if there still will be demand in seeing each of these systems individually, or if it's best just to really focus our attention on, on kind of bringing them together um, with the assumption that most users are not going to care if, they're, if, if deforestation in their area was detected by Sentinel-1 or Sentinel-2, um, they just want to know that something has happened. So again, very excited about um, what's coming in the world of alerts. Um, as I said, you know, for both of these, we're expecting to have some prototypes online um, within the next six months or so. So definitely be on the lookout for that. And I hope that you are as excited as I am. All right, so now we're moving to the second part of the presentation, um, a different set of, of research questions, looking more specifically at if we can better understand what is causing forest loss. Um, so we're going to be talking about three projects here. Um, one is, is actually looking at those GLAD alerts and seeing if we can uh, differentiate different causes or drivers of those alerts. Um, second is looking at and measuring the impact that specific commodities have on deforestation. Um, and finally, some work to map tree cover loss drivers at a global scale. So I will start off with the GLAD alert drivers. Um, let's see, we've already talked a lot about the alerts and detecting things in near real time. Um, but really a big question for us is, you know, when you look at the alerts, often it's, it's pretty clear what is driving that, right? You know, Alice showed the GIF of the, uh, the logging road in the beginning, you know, for our human eyes, that, that is pretty apparent. Um, and so, you know, if that's true, then theoretically a computer can also be trained to detect that kind of a pattern. Um, and so in this project, we're working with a company called Ellipsis Earth Intelligence, um, basically to look at these patterns of alerts and also combine that with recent Sentinel-2 images um, to try and identify on a monthly basis what is causing um, those deforestation alerts. So um, we're in early stages of this project. Um, we've basically just done a, a proof of concept so far for Borneo, just to say that you know this is seems promising. Um, but we're intending to expand and roll this out to a few countries um, over the next year um, to uh, yeah really test it out and, and start getting results in the hands of users. So um, I'll just give you a brief idea of what what we think this is gonna look like. Um, basically, for this proof of concept, we were looking at five different classes, uh, which have little thumbnails with some examples here of what that looks like. Um, so we're looking at like logging patterns, roads, um, large scale clearing. In this case, it's a, a 
fragmentation, um, smaller scale clearings, and burn of scars. And so what we did is um, worked with Ellipsis Earth Intelligence to produce training data uh, for these five classes, so examples basically um, of where these classes appear. Um, and we're using deep learning, so a convolutional neural network um, to basically learn to see the patterns of, of what these different classes look like based on the examples that we've given them. Um, and then we collect cloud-free Sentinel-2 images um, for any areas that had GLAD alerts in the past month and then classify those alerts with the driver information. And again, you know, the idea of this eventually is that that would then feed back to the Global Forest Watch platform and serve out information um, in addition to just, you know, where that alert is um, to see if we can add some additional context about what might be driving it. So again, early results, but just wanted to give you something to see uh, about what this looks like. Um, so first of all, this is just the Sentinel-2 images for a month in 2019 they were using for testing. Um, and anything, you know, that you're seeing an image here is because we had detected GLAD alerts in that area um, during that month. Um, and so basically using the convolutional neural net, then we we're able to detect or, or kind of classify these areas into uh, these different classes. So in this particular image, you can see the roads here um, in purple, that it's, it's getting quite well. Uh, we have some of this logging pattern coming off of the roads, which I think also performs well. Um, and then some larger scale clearings. Um, just looking at the image, I think it might be mining or something similar um, that, that have resulted in, in deforestation. So again, you know, just starting off, but I, I think this is really promising and exciting uh, and definitely looking forward to see where it goes in the next year or so. All right, moving now to a different project. Um, this is a project that the Global Forest Watch has, team has been working on um, with the Tropical Forest Alliance. Um, and the objective of this project is to uh, look at the extent to which uh, some of these big commodities, oil palm, soy, cattle, wood fiber, cocoa, coffee, and rubber, um, are replacing forests over time. Um, and so basically this research is based on the current extent of commodities, so where we have maps for, for the extent of palm oil and soy and, and um, some of these other commodities, uh, and combining that with the annual tree cover loss data to get a spatial picture um, of where this uh, forest replacement is happening. Um, so I'm not gonna go very deep into this, um, just to give you a, a little taste of what it looks like, the results. Um, but basically, you know, we're, we're able to look at the, the relative um, forest replacement by all of these different commodities. And what we found is that cattle is by far and away um, the biggest one caused the most deforestation with 45 million hectares in 2001 and 2015. Um, the next highest was oil palm and then soy um, and then several other commodities following uh, a bit behind that. So I think that that was a bit surprising just to see uh, how much bigger cattle was than any of the others. Um, and then we've also been able to look at the, the tree cover loss over time in areas that were replaced um, by these commodities and um, just looking a bit at the trends, you know, I think what, what stood out to us is, you know, many of these kind of stay the same, like cattle pasture was very similar throughout the time series, uh, but we are seeing some promising trends. Uh, for example, with the, the oil palm here in orange that, you know, in the past, uh, the last couple of years where we're looking at the palm oil, um, that actually it seems like there's been a drop in deforestation. So some promising trends, I think definitely a lot to look into here. Um, the main benefit that I see from this work though is that it's actually spatial information. So here we've aggregated the results um, at the second administrative level just to give an idea of where the most deforestation is happening related to these commodities. Um, and so you can see, you know, for cattle, most of that is focused in Latin America, um, with the special hotspots kind of on the arc of deforestation in the Amazon here, 
in Brazil, um, as well as in Paraguay. Um, I guess not overall not too surprising, but I think helpful to see it on this kind of a map. Uh, for oil palm, of course, most of the deforestation is concentrated in Indonesia and Malaysia. Um, and then for soy, again, focusing on, on South America, um, a, a bit different kind of geographies than with cattle, a little bit more in, in like the Cerrado areas of Brazil, um, in eastern Paraguay, it's like western Paraguay, Argentina, for example. So again, just kind of a, a spatial representation. Um, so this work is, is currently in review, um, and it should be coming out sometime in the next couple of months. Um, so keep an eye out for that. And with that, I'm going to pass over to uh, my colleague, David Gibbs, who's going to talk about a third project, um, looking at the drivers of tree cover loss global. All right, thank you very much, Michaela, for uh, passing it off to me. So Michaela talked about attributing uh, neural time deforestation alerts to different causes and about estimating how much tree cover loss is different, uh, due to different agricultural commodities. I'm going to take a slightly different tack on drivers of deforestation and talk about global patterns at a broader scale. So I'm, uh, we're going to look at five different possible causes of tree cover loss. This is not an exhaustive list of drivers of tree cover loss, but it covers most situations. The first one is, at, is expansion of agricultural commodities, uh, like oil, palm, soy, cattle, et cetera. Second, shifting cultivation. Third, forestry. Fourth, fire. And fifth, urbanization or expansion of cities, towns, villages, and settlements into forest areas. The very relevant, the most relevant and important thing with these probably is that um, some of them imply permanent loss of forest land. The forest is replaced with some other land use. So expansion of agricultural commodities, obviously forest is replaced with crop or pasture land and urbanization, uh, the forest is replaced with uh, cities or settlements of some kind. So in those situations, forest is gone permanently, whereas with forestry and wildfire, and to some extent shifting cultivation, the forest will come back. Shifting cultivation is kind of a, a hard to define edge case. But um, if we're able to map where expansion of agricultural commodities and urbanization is occurring, then we're able to say where forest loss is occurring permanently as opposed to temporarily. Colleagues of mine in Global Forest Watch and uh, collaborators at the Sustainability Consortium have uh, made a map of global drivers of tree cover loss. Uh, a paper came out about this in 2018. And very briefly, what they did was looked at very high resolution satellite imagery in about 4,800 locations, attributed the loss found at each of those locations to one of the five drivers that I just discussed then uh, combined that with a bunch of spatial covariate layers, like uh, where roads are and population data and where towns and cities are. And then uh, from that, uh, in the machine learning model, made a map of the drivers of tree cover loss at 10 kilometer resolution between 2001 and 2015. So this is a fairly coarse map, right? It's, you know, the cells are 10 by 10 kilometers, but it's useful for looking at the global patterns of what's causing tree cover loss. Uh, and the global patterns are, are, have stayed fairly constant from the original map, which went through 2015, and the most recent version, which will um, go through 2019, um, which, uh, so the current version goes through 19, yeah, so the current version goes through 2019, and um, and this will, uh, sorry, yeah, so this goes through 2019, um, and uh, the global patterns have been very similar. So, the, uh, deep, so um, commodity-driven deforestation and shifting agriculture are in the tropics, uh, forestry and wildfire are in temperate forests, urbanization is uh, generally uh, pretty uncommon, but found Southeastern US and so on. However, this uh, isn't so great for discerning very detailed trends in where tree cover loss is occurring 
So, yeah. So colleagues are working on um, an up, uh, a more detailed map that's more regional. Um, and they're starting this with the Mekong. This is a uh, prelim very preliminary version. Uh, so don't take the map too literally. Um, the, but right now they're thinking about including nine driver classes. The idea is that the classes of drivers will be different in different regions potentially. So in the Mekong, it'll be slightly different or maybe somewhat different uh, sources of, of tree cover loss compared to say Eastern Europe or South and Central America. The other thing is that this map is at one kilometer. Um, the, the other thing is that this map is at one kilometer resolution, which um, is uh, much better at discerning um, the details of tree cover loss or patterns of tree cover loss and what's permanent and what's not permanent. There's no uh, completion date for this yet, but um, we will keep you updated on it and um, you know, we are excited to be able to be working on this. Now on to monitoring forest carbon. So this is a fairly different subject. Uh, the question here is, can we map the carbon consequences of forest change? As you probably know, forests both uh, remove carbon from the atmosphere and then sequester it in their woody matter, both roots and trunks and branches, and also emit carbon as they are cut down or um, burned or uh, die for any reason. So in this way, forests are unusual in the climate change world in that they can be allies for mitigating climate change by removing carbon from the atmosphere or uh, can contribute to climate change by emitting carbon back into the atmosphere where it becomes carbon dioxide and, and uh, contributes to climate change. And so, we want to know where these things are happening with forests globally. Um, the one, so I'm going to start by talking about carbon sequestration or removals. Sometimes I'm going to say sequestration, sometimes I'm going to say removals, uh, but it's the same thing. So start with uh, yeah, how, how we are mapping carbon sequestration. The question, overall question is, how much carbon could be captured by forests? Um, and a 2017 paper has tried to estimate how much carbon could be captured if you reforested as much forest as possible. There's a lot of uncertainty in this because um, or there are several different causes for why this, there's so much uncertainty, but you can see that their estimate ranges from about three petagrams of carbon dioxide per year all the way up to 17. It, their, their upper estimate was so high that they couldn't even fit it on the graph. So that's a huge range of uncertainty. Um, and there are several reasons for that. One reason that I'm not really going to talk about much, but I uh, just want to mention is that there's no real consensus on how much area could be reforested. Different people have defined reforestable area or the opportunity of reforestation differently. And um, so that's one source of uncertainty. Uh, the others, another major source of uncertainty is how much carbon could be sequestered by a hectare or square kilometer of acre or acre of forest per year. And that's what I'm going to focus on. So these are sequestration rates. Um, I'm gonna be talking about mapping carbon sequestration rates. That's how much carbon could be sequestered per hectare per year by young forests in this case. The best available information right now comes from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change or IPCC. They provide guidance to, uh, to countries for their national uh, greenhouse gas inventories and uh, when countries want to include carbon sequestration from forests, they uh, use these IPCC defaults shown, I'm showing here for young forests. The issue with these sequestration rates is that, young, is that um, they use the same sequestration rate for the entire biome. So for example, all of the Amazon has one sequestration rate or all of Eastern China has one sequestration rate. All of Eastern Europe has one sequestration rate. And that's obviously unrealistic. There's a lot of variation in how much carbon forests capture per hectare per year, because um, there's a lot of variation in forests due to many natural variables. So this is, the IPCC provides a huge simplification for countries that work to do their national inventories. And that's because it's what's available. There isn't anything that's more spatially refined. So the question is, how can we improve on this? Um, 
And so what we're doing is making a fully spatial map of sequestration rates. Um, the methods that we're using are very similar to that map for drivers. We have a bunch of sample plots that where we've compiled information for um, sequestration rates from national forest inventories and, and um, journal articles. Uh, colleagues at the Nature Conservancy have done that, and we're also doing this in collaboration with NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Then uh, once we have compiled basically uh, all these sequestration rates from a variety, variety of literature sources, we combine that with spatial covariate layers, uh, in, including things like precipitation, temperature, soil properties, all things that affect how quickly forests grow and capture carbon. Combine that into a random forest machine learning model, and out from that we get a map of sequestration rates in um, young in young forests. Um, so what we have here is a map of sequestration rates in young naturally regenerating forests. Um, the darker colors are higher sequestration rates um, per hectare per year, and this is only showing rates for areas that are reforestable according to um, a article that came out in 2017. So, um, you know, this doesn't show all, you know, but right, it's only the areas that could be reforested. And that's if you let forests regrow naturally over time. It, we're, we're not looking at what happens if you let the forests, um, sorry, I understand that I'm having microphone issues and I'm getting messages about that. Um, yeah, I am close to the computer and trying to stay there. I'm sorry for the sound issues, everyone. I'm trying to speak loudly and stay close to the computer. Um, so if I've stumbled some, it's because I'm trying to figure out if there's anything I can do. Anyhow, um, I'm just going to try to speak loudly and stay close to the computer. So um, I'm, you're right. So we have sequestration rates for young naturally regenerating forests. That is if you, we're not looking at what happens if you let the forests um, if you help forests regrow by uh, planting them or watering them or fencing them off from herbivores or something. Um, so, right, and so this is going to become available in a few weeks. We have a journal, journal article that's accepted for publication and um, the data should also be available on Global Forest Watch within a few weeks when the journal article comes about. So what can we do with this information? Um, now that we have this map. One thing is you can choose your own restoration extent map. Basically, uh, we chose a map from an article that was published in 2017, but if you had a different area of restoration that you thought you might be able to use, you could uh, basically clip the, the global map that we've made that shows um, this more expansive area and say, well, for our restoration area, that you know, this is what we define as where we can restore this, and so let's see how much carbon we so this, our, our map is a tool in that way. Um, second, you can identify areas that have the greatest potential carbon returns on investment. Like what areas have the highest rates, what areas have the lowest rates. You probably want to um, work on reforesting areas that have, have higher carbon sequestration, sequestration rates if you're interested in carbon specifically. Um, and so in this case, um, yeah, this, this doesn't tell you what the cost of doing the restoration would be but it does tell you what the benefit would be or what the potential benefit would be. Um, and so that gets you halfway there to figuring out what the cost and benefit of the reforesting in a particular area is. Another thing to note is that our map, uh, we found with our, our analysis that sequestration rates are higher than the IPCC defaults. And so this could potentially incentivize countries to uh, reforest more of their land, right? Because they get they could get higher carbon benefits from letting forest regrow uh, using using these rates, uh, which yeah, as opposed to the IPCC rates. Third, um, we can refine the default rates for governmental mitigation strategies. So the um, so they now countries can use these more detailed rates, more spatially detailed rates than those ones that I showed earlier at the beginning where it's a single rate per biome. Um, and so hopefully uh, countries will use this, or not just countries, but also uh, states, provinces, towns, et cetera, um, in order to get better estimates for how much carbon could be sequestered by forests per year and um, figure out the contribution of forests to 
their climate change mitigation plans. Fourth, um, this continues to demonstrate that natural climate solutions are important for fighting climate change. And um, so we can use this to advocate for uh, the importance of natural climate solutions in mitigating climate change. And finally, um, as I said, this is, we did this specifically for natural uh, forest regrowth, but if you wanted to do some other kind of forest restoration that's more active, like planting the trees um, or you know, tending them, that would have um, potentially different carbon sequestration rates from natural for reforestation. And so that, um, this can serve as a baseline for that. You know, if you get like three tons of carbon per hectare per year from just letting forest regrow, um, are you going to get more or less from a more active intervention? So those are some of the uses for this um, sequestration make rate map that we've made. Hopefully um, people will come up with other uses and we'd love to hear about what you do with this once it becomes available. Now, moving on to uh, emissions and sequestration. So this is both sides of the coin. The previous project was just about se mapping sequestration. I'm also, so now I'm going to talk about mapping both sequestration and emissions. And um, one other difference to note is that the previous project was prospective. So it's how much carbon would be sequestered by forests per year um, if you let them regrow. The project I'm going to talk about now is retrospective, what, what has happened with forests over the last 19 years. Global Forest Watch has a basic map of gross emissions from tree cover loss, but only in the tropics. It's what I'm showing on the screen now. It's a big simplification of emissions, um, in that it's missing a, a bunch of things that actually affect how much carbon is emitted. But um, the other really important thing is that it's only emissions. So it doesn't show the sequestration side and therefore it's you know, missing one of those two arrows and it basically shows how forests contribute to climate change, but not how we can use them for mitigation. Um, and so it's you know, emitting half of the story and that's something that we want to fix with this project. So um, our, our goal for this project is to create 30 meter global maps of forest related greenhouse gas fluxes by combining intergovernmental panel on climate change methods with spatial data on forests. The IPCC methods are those national greenhouse gas inventory methods for forests. And we're applying those at 30 meter pixels from 2001 to 2019. So it's basically, you can think of this as um, greenhouse gas inventories for forests at a, you know, every 30, for every 30 meter area of forest, which is about 90 billion pixels in this model. Um, out of this, we're coming up with greenhouse gas emission or gross emissions from uh, tree cover loss, gross removals from tree cover loss, and then the difference between them or net greenhouse gas flux. The cartoon on the right uh, just demonstrates that we're overlaying a bunch of layers to uh, do these inventories, these spatial inventories. So these are some of the layers that we're using. This isn't even all of them. Um, there are 12 here and we have many others that we're using. Most of these are somehow related to carbon, but haven't been combined in this inventory framework that we're using. Um, also, many of them are recent. So a lot of this, you know, we couldn't have done this a few years ago, basically, because the data just simply didn't exist. Some key thing, layers, I, inputs I want to point out are the enhancing tree cover loss and gain, which um, if you're familiar with from Global Forest Watch, the drivers of tree cover loss, which I talked about at the beginning of uh, my section, and then the young forest removal rates, which I just talked about. So um, these and, and many others go into the inventory framework. And then, um, like I said, we're getting three different sets of results from this. So gross greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so this is just emissions without uh, thinking about the carbon sequestration involved. The, an earlier version of this work went through 2015 but we are updating this for 2019 um, and hopefully it will be published as a, a product for 2019. So um, you can see most areas of forest actually don't have all that much emissions. There's some areas like the Arctic deforestation in Brazil, Southeast Asia, Southeast US has a lot of forestry. Um, some you know, boreal areas have a lot of emissions from uh, fires, but in general, most forest actually is pretty low on on the other hand, basically all forest has carbon sequestration occurring, whether it's um, 
whether it, the forest is expanding or the forest is just there remaining forest. And actually, most of the sequestration is occurring from forest just remaining forest. That's something that um, is known but often forgotten. Just letting forest be forest uh, has tremendous carbon sequestration benefits, and that actually dwarfs the sequestration from uh, reforestation and forest expansion. And then if you combine the emissions and um, sequestration into, a, uh, into the difference between them, you get the net greenhouse gas flux. Um, and so red pixels are where emissions are higher than sequestration. Green pixels are where sequestration is higher than emissions. And you can see almost all forest has higher sequestration than emissions. So it's higher is net flux, uh, net sink uh, in some areas like parts of deforestation in Brazil and some parts of Southeast Asia are net greenhouse gas sources. And this gives a unprecedented view of um, the, the, um, the emissions, the sequestration and the balance between them in forests across the planet. There, there is uh, nothing else that is quite as detailed. So um, here are some, some takeaways of what we can do with this map uh, and other things to think about with it. So forests can be net sources or sinks for carbon. It depends on how they're managed, the time scale that you're working on or looking at, and the spatial scale that you're looking at. Um, second, it's important to track emissions and removals separately for more transparent accounting. So um, it's one thing if you say, well, our forests in our, in our country were a net carbon sink, but there's some emissions going on and then some extra, you know, more uh, sequestration than those emissions. But if you just report the net, then uh, there's no sense of what the emissions were. And those are different um, things that can be managed. So you can manage emissions and sequestration from forests separately, right? You can manage emissions by reducing tree cover loss and manage sequestration through the, you know, the amount of forest area. Um, and so it's important to be able to track both of those, and we can do that with this map, um, or with these maps rather. Finally, combine or not finally, uh, combining remote sensing with other data sources is powerful. So we're primarily using remote sensing, but all this remote sensing data is underpinned by um, some field data, lidar, um, and so in combination, all of these uh, allow for very um, uh, like a very strong model framework that can be updated over time data becomes available. And finally, um, maps are like, like what I've shown you here are relevant for a diverse mix of climate related policies and programs and stakeholders and can be used for spatially prioritizing implementation of national and subnational forest mitigation targets. So with that, I'm going to pass back to Alice to conclude the webinar. Wonderful. Thank you, David. Just one moment as I reshare my screen. All right, so to briefly recap, today we learned about various research projects that Global Forest Watch is working on focused on detecting forest change um, faster and in greater detail, improving our understanding of what causes forest loss, and on mapping um, how much carbon forests are emitting and sequestering. The research we discussed today is ongoing as we continue to take advantage of emerging data sources. That said, eventually you'll be able to access most of these data layers uh, either through the Global Forest Watch map or the open data portal. The sequestration rate project should be out in the next month or two uh, and will be available on the Nature Conservancy Natural Climate um, Solution Country pages. And as a reminder, we'll send you this presentation, which will have the links attached to it in the next week or so. All right, so the first question today is, do you have an estimation of the accuracy of the new alerts? Um, so I'll point this one over to Michaela, uh, who can speak a little bit more about the accuracy of both the GLAD plus alerts as well as the radar alerts. Great. Yes, this is a good question. Um, so we are working right now on an accuracy assessment um, for the rad alerts in the Congo Basin, um, and that has been going quite well. Um, we've been focusing mostly on the confirmed alerts, but seeing accuracies like in the upper 90s, um, both for 
uh, the producer's accuracy and the user's accuracy. So in terms of how well um, we are picking up, uh, I guess it's, it's like how uh, accurate we are at detecting changes that are actually there and how likely it is that the changes that we detect are actually true. Um, and so we're feeling quite good about that. Um, we haven't yet done accuracy assessments for uh, the GLAD plus alerts or for the RAD alerts outside of the Congo Basin, um, but we will be working on, on some of those accuracy assessments over the coming months. Thank you, Michaela. Um, and now that we're on the topic of GLAD and RAD alerts, uh, I'll just hop over to another question on them, which is, can we acquire the classification methods for GLAD and RAD? Is it based in a free code on in GEE? I'm interested in using in local scale. Yes, good question. Um, so right now the code is not available. Um, the GLAD, the current GLAD alerts are run in Google Earth Engine. The GLAD Plus are run on a, a private system at the University of Maryland. Um, the RAD alerts are also on Google Earth Engine, and eventually that uh, code will be made publicly available. Some of the pre-processing steps for the radar imagery, I believe, already are available. Um, so, not yet. Some of it will be eventually, um, but uh, but likely not everything. Thanks, Michaela. So the next question um, is on national forest uh, systems built on GFW data, uh, asking if there are examples of such systems and whether it's possible to build one for an additional country such as the Republic of Moldova. Um, I can take that one as well. So it's something that we have been discussing and we know that a lot of countries are building, um, you know, national monitoring systems as well as their own alert systems. Um, I think a bit of the challenge for us as a, a global platform is that, you know, we, we really have to prioritize where to spend our, our time. And especially when talking about, you know, our engineering staff and our web developers that often there's a lot more we want to do with the Global Forest Watch platform than we have time and resources for. Um, something that we have been talking about in a few countries is, you know, if we can build upon, as you're saying, you know, some of this existing work to create a more specific uh, alert system and use something like our map builder tool, which is essentially a template for, um, for building your own web platform to put that out. Um, so that is still conversations that are in development, but um, it just, yeah, I think we have been seeing a lot of interest in that and are thinking about how we can support that kind of thing in the future. Thanks, Michaela. So the next question is about carbon dynamics. Um, can we look at post deforest deforestation carbon dynamics and then uh, piggybacking on that question from the same person is how about looking at sparse tree cover such as under 30% canopy density? Yeah, thank you for those questions. Those are excellent. The, regarding the first one of um, can we look at post deforestation uh, carbon dynamics, we, we kind of can, kind of can't. Where the model that I talked about is focused on forest, either forest that stays forest or the forest to non-forest transition or non-forest becoming forest. And what happens after the forest disappears is kind of outside of the scope of our model, unless it becomes forest again. But we're not looking at the carbon dynamics of uh, agricultural land or um, I guess agricultural land would be the most relevant in terms of carbon dynamics following forest. And then in terms of sparse tree cover, we uh, can, we actually do have data on that, but the, it's probably not quite as, um, quite as reliable as when we use more dense tree cover, partially because the, the, the biomass that we're using is not really designed for very sparse tree cover and very sparse forest land or, or maybe 
uh, you know, like savanna areas to begin with, but um, it, it, is, it is possible. We're just not as focused on that one. We're more focused on these more densely forested areas. Thanks, David. Um, so the next question also focused on carbon is, how can commercial timberlands managers utilize the carbon mapping tool? And how does the tool classify rotational plantation forestry? Um, David, do you want to take a crack at that? Yes. So um, first, I'll go with how does the tool classify rotational plantation forestry? Um, it, so we're not actually de defining rotational plantation forestry in any way. We, one of the inputs to this map is, is planted forest and plantation areas to which we assign specific carbon sequestration rates. But we're then treating that the same as natural forest in that if tree cover loss occurs in the forest, in forested, in, uh, in plantations or planted forest, we count that as emissions, then as forests grow, we count that as sequestration. Um, one thing that I didn't cover at all in this is that we are also estimating carbon sequestration in harvested wood products. That's minuscule compared to all the other things that are happening with carbon and uh, kind of the, the detail of the model. So um, yeah, so we're not really classifying rotational plantation forestry. We uh, treat it like any other forest except it has its own sequestration rates. And then how can commercial timberland managers utilize the, um, the carbon mapping tool? So once it becomes available, if, um, if commercial timberlands want to, uh, we want to make it so that commercial timberlands or um, indigenous communities um, or nonprofits or uh, community organizations can submit uh, areas that interest them whether it's their, their, you know, their managed forest or their indigenous lands to um, the platform and see what the balance was between emissions sequest and sequestration um, over the time period. Um, and it, you know, this, is, this is one approach to mapping and understanding carbon sequestration and emissions. Um, you know, it's different from if you have field data or uh, various other approaches. So um, it you know, can be used to sort of like as a parallel or complementary method to whatever other data that commercial timberland companies may have. Thanks, David. Um, so the next question, which I'll pass over to Michaela, is how the GLAD project eventually feeds into policy changes on the ground. Great. Yeah, so we spend a lot of time doing uh, trainings and outreach and making sure that people across the world are aware that these tools exist. Um, and we definitely see the existing GLAD alerts and then also, you know, the, the two alert systems that I talked about um, as one of our most useful uh, tools that we have to offer people who are working at a very local level. Um, so, you know, we, we've seen a very wide range of use cases um, in, in using that information. Um, you know, we've worked with indigenous communities that are learning about new threats um, to their territories and making legal complaints uh, on the basis of, of areas that they've discovered thanks to the alerts. Um, similar for protected areas, we've seen a lot of interest in uh, you know, better monitoring very remote areas um, of these large protected areas that maybe can't be patrolled all the way on foot. Um, also for targeting law enforcement at a, a broader scale. And I would say, especially right now during the pandemic, when a lot of institutions are, you know, potentially having budgets being cut or are just concerned about the safety of their staff in the field, you know, they're not doing the normal patrol routes. And so actually this information is more important than ever to, to better understand um, where, you know, there is really a high threat or there really is some kind of illegal activity um, going on. Um, and then just one other one I'll mention is we also have a lot of work with the private sector um, and with the RAD alerts in particular are working with a number of oil palm companies um, to define a protocol basically for some priority jurisdictions um, where they're all working together pitching in resources um, to actually have 
uh, local government staff follow up on those deforestation alerts on the ground um, and then have an appropriate course of action depending on, on what's happening. You know, if it's linked to a company that has a zero deforestation commitment, you know, doing the right channels so that they know what's happening, if it's illegal, entering into the legal system. Um, and so I definitely think there is a lot of potential that we, we have already seen for these alerts um, and looking forward to how these new systems that, you know, bring all these benefits in terms of the detail um, and the, the consistency of information um, to see what we can do with those as well. Thank you, Michaela. Um, so the next question is about purchasing the tool, um, but I just want to reiterate that Global Forest Watch all platforms and tools are free um, and mostly for the most part open to the public. The only exception is Global Forest Watch Pro, which is still free, but uh, you need to go through a vetting process if you want to use that since it's um, more uh, for private entities that want to track um, supply bases across their supply chain. Um, but you can access the main Global Forest Watch map or dashboards just by going to globalforestwatch.org. Um, so the next question is, uh, what was the methodological approach followed uh, for determining the carbon sequestration in different components? Here in India, we use destructive method followed by allometric equa uh, equation evaluations. Um, David, do you want to talk a little bit about the approach? Yes, sure. So um, we, for the, for sequestration rates for forests, we combined many different data sources. The current version of the model, we're actually using six different data sources for sequestration rates. One is, um, or actually some of them come from national forest inventories. Uh, and so for, Europe and the US specifically. So that's based on um, field data specifically that, um, you know, that the that national governments have, um, have compiled. Then we're using IPCC default sequestration rates for some areas where we don't have better information. And that is based on journal articles that have used a variety of methods and IPCC authors have combined those. Um, and I guess many of those do at some point rely on allometric equations. Probably almost all of these actually at some point rely on allometric equations. Where uh, for planted forests, we're using a variety of uh, literature and data sources for different species in different regions. Um, and once again, that uh, you know, it's, it's probably based on a lot of um, sampling from different areas. So all of these uh, we apply to the, the appropriate kind of forest, say like this biome, this uh, or this kind of planted forest in this particular location, um, and then use that for uh, for mapping carbon sequestration rates. And we're we're doing this for above ground and below ground biomass and carbon in our model. Thanks, David. Um, so the next question is on land cover maps. Um, so on our work to, on replacement of forests by commodities, are we currently looking into developing precise uh, and up-to-date land cover maps to understand where there are already plantations, such as distinguishing palm oil from rubber, uh, timber plantation from cocoa, and so forth, uh, that are more prone to expanding into forests? On Global Forest Watch, the land cover map displayed is 2015, and it seems that it would have more gradual understanding of uh, deforestation patterns. Um, Michaela, would you like to answer that one? Yeah. Um, so yeah, we are working on a number of uh, land cover mapping efforts. Um, I would say in general, we kind of follow two approaches. Um, one is, is trying to work with researchers to get more specific maps of particular commodities. Um, so for example, you know, we, we had a, a publication last year that we were compiling all the information we could about plantation, uh, existing plantation maps. Um, and we're doing some work also to, you know, make sure that we are, are feeding into these processes to get the best, you know, cocoa data sets and, and new uh, palm oil data sets as, as they come online. Um, so certainly that's a focus for us. 
but we are also um, definitely interested in, in global land cover mapping. Um, and right now we are working on a project with uh, National Geographic and Google um, that would actually use you know, deep learning and all of the Google Earth infrastructure uh, to create a Sentinel-2 based land cover map and eventually get to land cover change. Um, so definitely something that we're working on. The other thing about the, the land cover map on Global Forest Watch right now and the reason we don't use it more um, is that it's, I think it's uh, 300 meter resolution or something along those lines. And so really a lot coarser than the, the forest change data sets that we feature on Global Forest Watch. So definitely interested in getting that um, to a higher resolution and making sure that that's something that's regularly updated. Thanks, Michaela. It's exciting that we're working toward um, updating the land cover map a little bit more regularly. Uh, circling back to methods for estimating forest biomass, um, David, if you could explain a little bit more about the methods used to estimate it and whether they're retrieved from satellite data um, and how accurate it can be, that would be quite helpful. Yeah, so it's a combination, the map of forest biomass is based on field data and satellite data. Colleagues at the Woods Hole Research Center are the ones who developed the mass of uh, the map of biomass that we have in Global Forest Watch. And what they did is um, basically compile a bunch of information on what the biomass density of forests in different places around the world, um, and then um, related that to a bunch of LIDAR data from satellites to infer biomass from LIDAR and then used satellite data, land, like uh, optical satellite data, I think Landsat, to um, infer and uh, interpolate the biomass for forests across the world. So basically they go from plot data to, um, that has measured biomass to LIDAR data to, um, to, to uh, optical satellite data. And so there definitely is some error involved in doing all of this. I don't know the uncertainty in it offhand, but like a lot of biomass maps, we are probably underestimating biomass densities at high levels, so we sort of have a saturation effect, and then maybe overestimating biomass it, uh, when biomass is low. And that's fairly common for these remote sensing biomass maps. I don't, but again, I don't have a, a great sense offhand of uh, the, any quantification of that, unfortunately. Thanks, David. Um, all right, the next question is whether uh, we have any suggestions for um, books or papers or websites to go to to learn more about remote sensing applied to the study of climate change and its impacts for someone just starting out in this field. Um, Michaela and David, I'm not sure if you have any suggestions. Yeah, I, I can't think of a specific resource off of the top of my head, um, but I will just say that, you know, in my experience, there are a ton of uh, like remote sensing and GIS courses um, that are available online. And I know that, you know, for example, NASA has a, a really great training program. Um, Alice, I think you've worked with them. They have a very specific uh, like webinar series that I think is super useful for anyone interested in remote sensing. Yeah, so NASA RSET does a really, really great um, webinar series and holds many different series on various topics. Um, let me see if I can pull a link and send it to you all in the chat. And while she's looking for that, I, I do not have any specific resources to suggest, but I, um, I think that there must be some fairly good review articles in journals that would you know, look across literature to say what the effect of climate change is on forests. I don't know any offhand, can't recommend any offhand, but I think a, a Google Scholar search or equivalent would probably yield some for you. 
Thank you both. Um, I found the link to the RSET webinars and I'll send that in the chat right now. All right, so the next question um, is whether GFW tools can be used to validate planned forest change uh, envisioned by government plans and private companies, private company intended projects. Yeah, I can take a step at that one. Um, so yeah, I mean, our, our monitoring tools, you know, are, are looking at where there has been uh, tree cover loss. Um, you know, we talked a lot about the alerts today, which I think are useful for, you know, if you're trying to do anything that has a time sensitive component and could certainly be used to look at, you know, whether or not uh, deforestation is happening in the areas that it was planned or outside. Um, we also, one of our main products is an annual tree cover loss data set. Um, that product, because it's not, you know, a, meant to be a, a near real time rapid thing, I, I find to be a bit more accurate um, in terms of the area that it picks up. Um, and so if it's not super time sensitive, I would recommend using that annual layer. Um, and certainly, you know, you can cross that with uh, other data sets, as you say, about where zoning um, allows for clearing or not. And that can give you a, a pretty good idea of whether or not those plans are actually being followed. Thanks, Michaela. Um, so the next question is, why are there some sources of carbon in the Amazon where there is supposed to be a sink? Um, David, can you take this one? Yeah. So um, it's an interesting question. And we receive questions like this occasionally when we show drafts of the, uh, of the emissions map or the net flux map. And the general answer is that um, we are using, for the most part, global data, so it's going to be globally generally correct, but um, not necessarily perfectly correct in every specific location or every pixel or, or uh, you know, in very detailed or specific, you know, small areas. So, um, but we are interested in hearing about where people think that our map is inaccurate, and I don't know what areas the question asker is referring to specifically in the Amazon, but um, the, whoever asked this question is welcome to email me. My email address is up on the slide, and um, you know, describe the area more specifically and what you think is inaccurate about it. Any other people are welcome to do the same, uh, and hopefully we can use that for improving the, the work that we're doing. Thank you, David. Um, so the next question is, uh, someone is interested in finding out if the GLAD system can be used to monitor carbon sequestration in cocoa agroforestry systems, as well as monitoring deforestation in the deforestation-free cocoa systems. Uh, Michaela, do you wanna take a first crack at that? Yeah, I can talk about the deforestation part, um, and then David, if you have anything to add on, on the carbon sequestration. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think we're still assessing how well the GLAD alerts work in cocoa agroforestry areas. Um, you know, the big challenge is that we're looking at the tree canopy, essentially, and, and what's happening there. And so if there are, if there's cocoa, for example, underneath that canopy level, then that's actually not something that we can see using optical satellite imagery. Um, and so I know that there is a lot of interest and work um, in West Africa looking at cocoa in particular, and we're trying to figure out, you know, one, if, if the existing tools that we have can be useful, um, and two, if not, or if there are other data sets out there, how can we make sure that those are made publicly available um, and are available through Global Forest Watch? And I... I guess I can add in terms of uh, monitoring carbon sequestration that the, the most detailed information we have on carbon sequestration so far spatially is what I talked about earlier with that carbon sequestration map. There might be more specific information in particular places, but it's not, you know, it's not a, a global map. Um, so if someone has more detailed information on carbon sequestration in cocoa agroforestry systems, that could very well be 
more appropriate for the area that you're interested in than the sequestration map that we've made. Um, it also really depends on the kind of situation that you're um, that you're talking about. So, like what we've done is a map of natural forest regrowth, which may not really apply to cocoa. In which case, your your best bet may be to try to um, you know do some field studies or look for similar data from somewhere else in the world. Unfortunately. All right. Thank you both. Um, so I think we have time for just one or two more questions. Um, so the next one is, do you know of any forest loss monitoring systems working at the local scale with higher precision than Global Forest Watch? Uh, Michaela, do you uh, want to take that one? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so yes, there are definitely other monitoring systems. I think David said, uh, said it well earlier in responding about the carbon is that, you know, really our focus is on very large scale kind of global maps and with the alerts as well, you know, really our aim uh, with the GLAD alerts, of course, we currently do have tropical extent and our aim with the Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-1 alerts is eventually to get to that same pan-tropical level. Um, what that does mean though is that, you know, at a very local individual scale, um, we are not necessarily going to be as accurate as a system that is built just for that area. Um, and so there are a number of alert systems that exist, um, you know, that are built for purpose for specific places. Um, there are national alert systems in place in uh, like Brazil, there's been one since uh, the, the early 2000s. Um, Peru and Colombia and Ecuador are also building out their own alert systems. Um, and so th those definitely do exist. Uh, Brazil also there are several civil society initiatives um, that are looking specifically at alerts um, and one project Mapio Mas Alerta that has come out recently that actually is taking all those various alert systems from government and civil society and then using uh, three to five meter resolution planet data uh, to basically try and validate or, or further refine those alerts to get something that's even finer scale. Um, so yes, local products with a higher precision, with higher accuracy definitely do exist. Um, but, you know, I think the important thing to remember is that they're not available everywhere. Um, and so really that's where we see our tools and our alerts coming in is um, in those areas that don't necessarily have those alert systems or where we can supplement the ones that are already existing uh, to get a better indication of, of where forest change is happening very quickly. Thank you, Michaela. And the last question um, that we have time for is, will high conservation value areas um, also be available on the maps and will it be included in the alert in the areas with alerts? Yeah, uh, I'm jumping in to take this one. Um, so <laughs> um, I guess the, one of the things about Global Forest Watch is that, um, you know, we're covering pretty much everywhere with forests. And if you're interested in some particular area, whether it's a high conservation value area or some indigenous land or, uh, you know, your, your county's forest, you can subscribe for alerts in, in that particular area. You can make a, you know, select your boundary, subscribe for alerts and get information on that area as, as things happen. Um, and so even though we're not doing anything with high conservation value boundaries specifically, uh, you can still keep, you know, if you know where your high, some high conservation value boundaries are for forests, you can, uh, you know, subscribe to that area and keep tabs on what's happening. And that goes with all different kinds of areas that people are interested in. Thanks, David. All right, so we're going to close out for today. Thank you everyone for joining and thank you Michaela and David for presenting today. Um, if you have any additional questions, if we weren't able to get to your question, um, please feel free to reach out to any one of us. Our emails are on the screen. Um, you can also reach out to our team at gfw at wri.org. Um, thanks again and we hope to see you soon.